Great. So now is the time to start uh, the second edition of ICE Creative ACS Seminar. Um, but before getting into the invited talk, I will briefly um, introduce uh, about the seminar and the timetable. Uh, so um, while the first edition was uh, held as a hybrid seminar, uh, this second edition is fully online um, and um, all the people are joining us uh, via Zoom webinar. Uh, but we, uh, we continue this uh, tradition of using Google Docs for shared seminar notes so that, um, you know, not only those who can, who are good at English, but also who are interested in the content can understand and uh, discuss uh, what we felt about the seminar content using these shared docs. So just keep in mind that um, engage, get engaged in the discussion using this uh, Google Docs. Then uh, here's the timetable. Um, so I'm now um, introducing the seminar, uh, but um, immediately after uh, these slides, um, I will introduce Amy uh, to give a talk, and then um, followed by the talk by Bruce. And then uh, finally, uh, we will uh, do a kind of casual panel discussion and also uh, take uh, questions and uh, discussion topics from the audiences, uh, and then do the closing, a quick closing. Uh, this time, uh, well, oh, it's this first edition, but it's second edition. Uh, <laughs> the second edition has a focus on AI for HCI. Uh, so it's really about how we can utilize the artificial intelligence technologies for better human computer interaction. And we have two invited speakers. Um, the first is Amy Pavel from the University of Texas at Austin. And the second invited to, uh, to speaker is uh, Xin Yu Bruce Liu from the University of California, Los Angeles. And actually uh, these two uh, speakers are uh, co-authoring the uh, WISP best paper last year. So uh, for the panel discussion, we might be able to hear about how these, you know, collaboration between universities and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and this seminar is organized by this organizing team. Um, I'm June here, uh, but there are many other um, students and also professionals uh, helping us organize this seminar. Uh, it's organized by ICE, which is a national research institute in Japan and co-organized by uh, ACM uh, Sikai Japan chapter. We are also supported by the advisory board. So I think uh, now it's, it's, it's time for introducing Amy Pavel from uh, Department of Computer Science at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, I'm stopping sharing my screen. And uh, so now, Amy, it's your turn. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I'm just going to share my slides really quick. All right. So thank you so much for hosting me. I'm excited to be here. And I think the topic of the seminar is really exciting. So um, yes, I'm Amy. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas, Austin in the computer science department. And so today I'm going to talk about a little of my work about human AI systems for accessible creativity. And to motivate this, um, today we can easily communicate with more people than ever. So using a variety of different techniques, we can sort of communicate with a broad audience. However, the way that we have are able to communicate has been rapidly changing. So in the past 10 years, uh, we have moved from using primarily text to communicate with others in forms like articles, how-to instructions, you know, travel blogs, and or even expert posts, to communicating with video in formats like explainer videos, how-to demonstrations, travel vlogs, and even expert video essays. And the amount of video being uh, produced and consumed today is massive. So over 1 billion hours of video are consumed per day. Uh, 730,000 hours are uploaded per day. And it, these videos aren't just entertainment. Um, when asked to rate the main reasons for watching videos, uh, a prior survey of about 12,000 people found that people actually watch videos to learn new things and to dig into new interests. These are some of the top reasons that people listed. However, I think that video is just the start of it. So while we're communicating with video today, uh, what could be next? It could be AR and VR. It might be uh, tangibles or maybe robotics. So we create things to share with others, but how do we know what's best to share with our audience? So it depends on the audience's needs. Um, and I will use video as an example. 
So when is video useful? So if I'm, I'm sharing my content with an audience who is watching and listening to the video all the way through, um, then videos are great. Uh, so they can capture your attention. They can provide both spatial and temporal detail, like uh, this person in a physical therapy exercise, moving his shoulders. And they can also promote recall. So if someone sends me a video, maybe I'll actually do my physical therapy exercise instead of forgetting. On the other hand, if you want to look at a video later, so for instance, maybe you, you missed your uh, teacher's lecture and you wanted to find a particular point of interest, it can be really hard to reference. You might need to scrub back and forth in the video uh, to play and pause and find what you're looking for. And while this is a small problem, if you're a learner, it turns into a much bigger problem if you're a film study scholar, like trying to study films, for instance. On the other hand, uh, what if your audience is missing access to some part of the video? So for instance, uh, blind people and people with visual impairments might not be able to see the content in the video. So silent cooking videos set to music like this one uh, might be difficult to interpret. And while video and in the future, you can imagine that uh, other types of interfaces also in introduce potential accessibility barriers. And finally, you might be missing the proper background. So if my audience is like uh, beginner crocheters, then perhaps this expert crochet stitch is like a step too far. Um, and you might need more broken apart videos to simplify it a bit. So the point here is that audience members require different representations for different tasks, depending on their goals, disabilities, or accessibility needs and context. And this is a well-known but poorly addressed problem. So the universal design guidelines for learning suggest that there's not one means of representation that's optimal for all. And instead, we want to provide multiple ways that people can consume our information. So my goal is to make communication effective and accessible for the full range of audience goals, disabilities, and contexts. And my key idea here is to combine multiple methods of communication together. So imagine uh, you're a video author and you would love to do this. Uh, you would like to uh, improve your communication so that you can reach everyone. However, this currently takes a long time and it could require tedious and repetitive work if I wanted to create an audio description or if I wanted to create an AR version of my uh, video to watch later. It might be time consuming and repetitive, but at the same time, it uses my expertise of knowing what's important to make those tough decisions. On the other hand, I could use uh, automation. So maybe I can automatically describe everything in my video. However, uh, it's in, it doesn't necessarily have the context that I have in order to make um, good decisions about the content. And it can work best when the decisions are made kind of at a low level. So my goal is to develop uh, systems that combine the strength of both humans and computation to improve communication. And so my work attempts to understand the author um, then the audience and what they want, and also current automated tools and how far they'll get us, and try to create new interactive techniques to sort of bridge the gap. Okay, so um, one of my first questions when I investigated this was how could we address a bunch of different audience goals? So in other words, how can we make video, visual media like video useful? So during my PhD, I looked at a bunch of different cases where people might want to use videos for education, uh, for, uh, for a film scholarship, for 360 videos. And then when I went on to, because I was representing all these videos in text, when I went on to my postdoc, I decided to look at how can we make visual me media actually accessible to people with visual impairments who can't see what we're creating. So I did some work across uh, making memes and GIFs that we share accessible uh, to videos and to AR and VR, and as well as presentations like this presentation. However, this work assumes that the author is maybe sighted using a screen and the audience is perhaps blind and using this, uh, a screen reader to access their computer. However, um, my most recent work, I've, excited, I've decided to look at the other direction. So what if the author uh, is blind and would like to create engaging media for sighted audiences? So I've looked at how we can make authoring visual media accessible uh, through two projects that I'll talk through today, which are AV Script, uh, which is a tool for blind and visually impaired uh, video authors, and Diffscriber, uh, which is a tool for creating presentations. So um, to reflect the seminar theme today, so uh, I'm going to talk about creative HCI for accessibility, and I'm going to try to answer two questions with this talk. 
So the first question is, how can we consider accessibility during our creative process of making media? And question two is, how can we build accessible authoring tools that can further the creative agency for people who are blind or visually impaired? So to answer the first question, I'll talk about um, some work to make video and presentations accessible. And for the second question, I'll talk about some work to make accessible tools for authoring both videos and presentations. Okay, so to start off, uh, this is a project about making videos accessible. So uh, this project is called Rescribe, and we published it at uh, WIST 2020. And I did this work when I was a postdoc at CMU and also working at Apple. So for some bit of background, videos provide both audio and visual information. And I want to like separate two key accessibility concerns. So audio descriptions, they provide narration of the visual content, and they try to avoid overlapping important audio in the video. And on the other hand, there's closed captions. Those you might have seen those more frequently. They transcribe the audio in the visual uh, in the video so that you can um, so that people who are deaf or hard of hearing can access the the uh, spoken content. So in this talk, I'm talking about audio description. So that's the narration of the visual content. And I'll share an example. Uh, most audio descriptions are created for movies, but here's an example from like a public access video. It takes a village to maintain and operate a place like Mount Rainier National Park. What role will you play? Who will be the future of Mount Rainier National Park? Job titles appear, including trail crew, archaeologist, engineer, climbing ranger, and more. Future rangers, children wear uniforms for different park jobs. Linnea. I'm a future archaeologist. So here, the author, in order to fit everything they wanted to describe, they had to omit some details. For instance, they did not say all of the job titles that appeared. Um, and then the audio describer also mentioned Linnea, but didn't describe her orange safety vest. Uh, so authors have to shorten the descriptions and offset the timing in order to make everything fit. So we interviewed nine uh, audio description professionals and found that core a core challenge is timing. So there's so little space in a video uh, and there's so much you want to say about the visual content that is difficult to make everything fit. So these audio description professionals describe their process. Uh, they I first identified the gaps in speech. Then they created descriptions for all of the visual content that they would like to describe. And finally, they spent a lot of time editing down both the descriptions and uh, the audio placement in order to make everything fit. And this could take uh, like 10 times the length of the original video. So our goal in this project was to enable audio descriptions experts and novices to create audio descriptions efficiently. And our key idea here was that we could jointly optimize uh, shortening text and lengthening source audio in order to make uh, as much as we could describe fit into the time that we could. So this is Rescribe. Using Rescribe, authors input their source video. Rescribe automatically detects uh, speech and silences. It also transcribes the speech and visualizes the silences as gaps uh, so that you can see about how much time you'll have to describe. Authors can navigate to the gaps using either the transcript or the timeline. So here, an author jumps to a gap using the timeline. Oh, OK. Sorry. Uh, the audio is not playing. That's OK. All right. So the author can then, once they jump Shots to the gap. Shots of lavender. In Sorry. The author can then go ahead and describe the scene. So here, the author says, uh, title, Gabby's Guide to Ojai, what is Gabby cooking? And they write a couple more descriptions about the scene. So they might say, um, a montage of bright shots in Ojai. Next, the creator can record their description. So the cool thing about Rescribe is that people only need to record their descriptions once, um, and then Rescribe will automatically edit everything to fit for them. So here, the creator records his descriptions. Shots of lavender in a farmer's market. Red flowers against a white house and blue sky. After that, they can click create to automatically edit their audio descriptions to fit. So now their audio descriptions are a bit too long to fit in the space, but they can click create and it will automatically shorten these descriptions. Title, Gabby's Guide to Ojai. A montage from Ojai. Shots in a farmer's market. Red flowers 
A courtyard and a pool. Gabby bikes along a path. Close up of French fries. Gabby drinks sangria. Gabby and Thomas sit on a couch. Hey, hi. So if an author doesn't like their descriptions, they can uh, change how long they are as well. So Rescribe renders three types of audio descriptions. So the first type is extended audio descriptions. Those pause the entire video to play back the audio. Um, however, these are kind of disruptive to the video content, especially if you're watching for entertainment. The second method, uh, automatically shorten the descriptions to fit in the time provided. Uh, so a montage of bright footage from Ojai became a montage from Ojai. This works by adjusting the start time of the descriptions and automatically shortening the descriptions. And finally, we enable a third type of descriptions, which was brand new for this project called extended inline descriptions. These descriptions uh, adjusted the description start time and extended the underlying audio by seamlessly finding like loops that worked well um, so that you couldn't tell that the audio was changing. So here is an example of the extended inline description. You can try to listen to hear if you can uh, listen to the audio loop. No, Gabby's Guide to Ojai, a montage from Ojai. Shots of lavender in a farmer's market. red flowers against a white house and blue sky, a courtyard and a pool. Gabby bikes along a path. So a sip of tater tots in French room. Gabby drinks sangria. Gabby and Thomas sit on a couch. Gabby's Guide to so that fit in more content uh, by underlying the uh, by uh, extending the source audio. So Rescribe is powered by a couple automatic methods, and I'll kind of go through this quickly. So first, Rescribe identified the gaps in the video by transcribing the video and aligning it to the underlying audio, then using a CNN-based method to detect music and silence. Next, when the creator describes the video, it aligned the, sc uh, the script that the creator had written to the underlying audio. And finally, and this is the core part, it edited the descriptions by shortening or deleting them or adjusting or extending the underlying audio. So to, just to give a brief overview of how this works, uh, for each description sentence that someone wrote, we created a bunch of candidate description sentences. So shorter version that might be uh, good sentences. So for instance, for Gabby and Thomas are back on their couch in a sunny living room, uh, we created the candidates, uh, Gabby and Thomas are back in their living room and Gabby are back. After that, uh, we scored these candidates based on a bunch of different approaches. So uh, based on how good the edit quality would be if we created that, uh, we scored it based on its coherence, which was kind of a proxy for grammatical correctness. Then we put all of this into an optimization program and figured out what sequence of, of descriptions would be able to fit in the time provided. We evaluated Navi uh, Rescribe with a couple different user groups. So first we asked novices to create descriptions, both using Rescribe and using uh, just the traditional video editor. We also asked blind members, uh, audience members to watch uh, descriptions using Rescribe. And then finally, uh, we interviewed professional audio describers. We found out that novices were able to create just uh, audio descriptions with far less uh, overlapping audio uh, than they did with a traditional editor. So they made fewer of these overlap errors, which can really disrupt the listening experience. The blind audience mentioned that Rescribe's inline and extended inline descriptions, they liked them better than the unedited extended descriptions. Um, in particular, they thought that the extended inline descriptions were the best of both worlds. And finally, the professional audio describers, they had some really clever ideas uh, for how to use automation in the future. They mentioned that they would like uh, the tool to automate um, the things that they had already described before because the exact wording of their descriptions was important. So, for instance, if they had described, you know, an iPhone and an ad, for instance, uh, they might like to reapply that description. On the other hand, they really appreciated that Rescribe uh, left the creative work to the describers and sort of automated away the more boring and time consuming editing part. So in Rescribe, uh, we created these expert quality descriptions by jointly optimizing the text and media together. And we created this new form of description called an extended inline description. But this project kind of led us to think about how should we actually improve the accessibility in our creative process? When we're creating a video, uh, Rescribe only works after the video has already been planned, captured, and edited. And so Rescribe comes in and lets you add these audio descriptions. That's also how closed captions uh, work as well. So they all happen kind of after editing. 
And uh, this will link to Bruce's work as well. So uh, we have a couple projects that, that cover looking at audio descriptions after editing. However, um, I worked on some additional work to explore descriptions at other stages of the process. Uh, so this was also work with Bruce to in investigate how we could enable accessibility at uh, search time rather than only uh, trying to uh, author audio descriptions. And then we also looked at uh, how, how we can embed descriptions in the initial, uh, in the initial video. So just to briefly describe uh, in this search work, uh, Bruce created this amazing system that basically took uh, video results and tried to let users know about how accessible they would be. And on the embedded description side, uh, this tool by Yihao basically looked at, uh, can we actually prompt presenters to do a better job at describing their slides? And it did this by providing some real-time feedback. So as a presenter talked, uh, it would light parts of the slide up in, green, up in green as they covered it to hopefully encourage the presenters to describe more of the content on their slides. So today's... Oops. All right, so for question one, how can we consider accessibility during the creative top process? We can build tools for improving accessibility that automate uh, more boring parts of the work and preserve the creative work that goes into uh, creating accessible content. We can also integrate accessibility while authoring rather than waiting all the way to the editing stage to make stuff accessible after it's already been created. Okay, so uh, let's go on to question two. So question two is how can we build accessible authoring tools that further creative, uh, creative agency? So these projects look at how people who are blind or low vision uh, can create uh, visual media. So I'll start with AV script, which is a tool for accessible video, edi video editing with audio visual scripts. And this work was really fun. It was done across uh, multiple locations. So uh, it started at UCLA and then um, at Naver AI and then here at UT Austin. Uh, and this work was led by Mina Ha, who's now my uh, PhD student at UT. So when we create videos to share with others, we often don't just share our raw video. There's lots of uh, things that can sort of go wrong. Instead, we edit the video to cut out low quality footage to make it more engaging. So you might, for instance, want to remove the blurry parts or speed up repetitive actions. So many visual uh, creators with visual impairments would like to author videos. However, this editing process is currently inaccessible or inaccessible. It relies on people visually inspecting the footage to find those low quality shots, for instance. So Mia conducted a formative study by first uh, analyzing a bunch of existing YouTube videos to find out how creators with visual impairments currently edited videos. She also conducted semi-structured interviews with uh, eight creators with visual impairments who had vi video editing experience already. So people identified the following challenges, and I'll just focus on three of them here. So first, it's really difficult to recognize the visual content in a video if you're not able to see it. So for instance, uh, say in this video, I would like to cut the video when I start to walk back towards the camera. So here, uh, the video doesn't have any audio, so it's difficult to know where she turns around and so therefore where to make the cut. As a result, um, people with visual impairments who author videos reported that they often described the scene as they filmed. Uh, so they would, they would narrate what they were doing so they would later be able to edit it. However, uh, this was inconvenient because it made it so that they couldn't use the underlying audio in the video. They always had to have their narration in the background. It also didn't let them focus on what they were doing because the narration was so much sort of cognitive effort. Second, it's difficult to assess the visual quality of a video. Uh, so this is some video footage that is a little bit shaky because the creator is holding the camera. Uh, but if you're not able to see the footage, it's not really clear that this shakiness is here. Finally, browsing and skimming videos is quite challenging if you're using a screen reader. While people who have vision can sort of look at uh, different thumbnails in the video to figure out where they're at, with a screen reader, it's all just text-based. And so you don't get those uh, the visual information as you navigate. So here's an example from our user study. Oops. Three minutes, next frame, play button, pause. Next, six slider, three minutes. 
three, three minutes, two, three, two minutes, two, two minutes. Two, two. So if you're not seeing the content, it could be really difficult to understand. So in this project, we present this tool called AV Script. AV Script allows editing via audio visual scripts. So AV Script features a transcript of all the narration in the video, along with a couple extra tools uh, to make it useful for blind creators. First, it highlights errors in red, such as when the camera is moving a lot. Um, second, it also highlights uh, pauses and other types of visual errors, for instance, blurriness. In addition, it, allow, it allows creators to browse scenes via these scene high-level scene descriptions, and also to browse the video as a whole using the outline. Um, so the outline gives an overview of all the main scenes in the video to let people quickly skip around. So you creators can also search for content or scenes of interest like the microwave. Uh, they can browse the outline to jump to that part in the audiovisual script. And they can edit the audiovisual script directly in order to edit the video. So there the creator cut out uh, the long pause. So AV script is powered by a computational pipeline. Um, the first thing that AV script does is it segments and labels the scenes in the video. So to do this, uh, it first uh, transcribes the video and then segments the transcript at the word level and finds an alignment to the video. Then we extract all of the noun phrases in the transcript uh, and use this to detect objects in the transcripts or objects in the video that are related to the transcript. We do this because the important objects might be more likely to be important in determining the scene boundaries. So for instance, if I'm in the kitchen and describing uh, the pot, it might be more important than the things in back of me. After we've detected relevant objects, uh, we segment the objects using a sliding window based method looking for big differences in between one set of objects and then a set of objects in the next scene. And then finally, we create the scene descriptions using a vision and language model called blip. So here's an example. Uh, it says like scene six, a blurry photo of several empty chairs around the table. Scene seven says a pantry full of food and some shelves and baskets. So to evaluate AV script, we conducted a technical evaluation. Um, so first we evaluated the segments that uh, AV script created. So to do this, we had two annotators and AV script create scene boundaries. So what we found out is that uh, humans don't agree with each other that much. Um, and AV script agrees with humans similarly to how well humans agree with each other. And why this happens is that the segment, there's often many correct segmentations. Uh, so they were often high quality segments, but that at a different grand level of granularity rather than being like an incorrect segmentation. Okay, second, we detect visual errors. And I won't go into detail, but essentially we use three different methods for, de uh, for uh, detecting objects, which can help creators find things they don't want featured in the video, like, you know, a pile of laundry, for instance. Uh, we also detect bad lighting and camera blur. Then we insert these items into the transcript. So we find out that our system has pretty high uh, precision in terms of detecting visual errors, but lower recall. And a reason for this is that the creator's videos in our study uh, are filmed by people with visual impairments. And overall, the video is a little bit shakier than, um, for instance, a like steady video uh, on a tripod. So in order to keep the number of total visual errors down, we set the threshold pretty high to make sure that people were deleting actual visual errors when they chose to delete them. And otherwise, uh, we were sort of leaving the video alone. So we conducted a user study with AV script. Um, and what we found out when we had creators compare it to their own existing editing tools uh, was that people were able to edit the video more efficiently. And so in a set amount of time, they were able to kind of, these are the edits that the users made and more users were edit, able to edit their whole video using AV script. We also conducted an exploratory study where we asked people to come in with their own footage and use AV script to edit it. Um, so people edited footage related to planting and tutorials. And after using it, um, they were really excited about how easy it was to learn to use. And they also expressed that they would like to use it to for film new types of videos. So now if they know that AV script might let them know that the camera's shaking, uh, they're less nervous to like carry around their camera and try out that method. All right, um, so our second project in this area is called Diffscriber. And so this is about supporting accessible presentation authoring. 
Um, and this work was led by Yi Hao Peng at uh, CMU uh, with his co-advisor, uh, Jeff Bigham. And we presented this work at WIS 2022. So today's slides are pretty ubiquitous. Uh, they're kind of a dominant form of communication across both education, work, and even hobbyist or activist groups. However, uh, so if you're a blind professional, you also need to communicate via slides, but it's pretty difficult to author slides if you just use a screen reader. So here's an example of a slide. Um, and imagine you're reviewing the slide without seeing it. Uh, so here I'm going to blank out the slide with a white um, with a white cover so that you can focus on the screen reader. So here's what the screen reader says about one element on the slide. It's an audio book, text box, layout item. So you can get more information about the slide. Uh, for instance, you might want to know how the text is laid out. And so here's the information you'll get. Actions available. Size, 171.7 points wide, 26.3 points tall, position, 19.1% from left, 83.3% from top. Right two points. Position at 185.43 points X and 449.89 point Y, scale. So we don't often um, we don't often use presentation software by thinking about the low level X and Y values. So this is really difficult to edit slides this way. However, we noticed that blind people that we've talked to before already edit slides. So we conducted a formative study with nine uh, blind presentation authors to find out how people currently author slides. What we found out is that blind slide authors currently create text-based slides. So either they use a simple slide template or create a Google Doc that lists the uh, titles and text they would like to include on their slide. Then they give their slide to a, a cited collaborator. Um, the cited collaborator might change the layout, the content, um, and you know add a background in this case and send it back to the blind presentation author. So blind authors really valued the expertise and efficiency of their collaborators. But the collaborators only described the slides visually occasionally. So blind authors rarely knew what the collaborator had actually changed. Maybe they had reworded their text or created th this new visual layout. In this case, um, they changed the title from what's amazing is to what's amazing is it's. They also changed the layout of the slide. So they moved from this, um, this short bullet list to a horizontal list with images on top of each item. So blind authors rarely get descriptions. And so it's quite difficult for them to provide feedback to the collaborators. So in this project, we created Diffscriber. Our goal here was to help authors more fully understand the visual content on their slides so they could more fully participate in slide authoring. So Diffscriber takes the original slide and the revised slide as input, and it automatically changes, uh, analyzes the changes made to the content layout and style and provides the changes to the presentation author as a Google Slides extension. And this extension is accessible via a screen reader. So our interface includes both a side content list and a change description list. So I'll talk about the slide content list first. The slide content list is a bit basic. It sort of provides what the original presentation um, slide provided. So using this extension, you can review all of the content in the slide. Um, so you can review elements like the title, uh, which is what's amazing. It's the background image, et cetera. So here's an example of Background image, a white wallpaper with confetti on it, menu pop-up, title, what's amazing is it's menu pop-up button. So that's how the screen reader can sort of use this extension. When reading the slides, authors can also access the lower level uh, style of individual slide elements, including the font size, font size, style, and slide title. All right. So after the slide content list, we provide a change description list. So the change description list uh, lets authors load the original version of their slides and also the slides from their collaborators. Then it analyzes three different types of changes. The first type of change is a content change. A content change is some change to the underlying content that was provided. So maybe they've reworded the text or they've replaced the text with a corresponding image uh, to represent that text. So here's an example of the content changes. So for instance, we have uh, added a background image of a white wallpaper with confetti on it and added an image to the top of each bullet item in the horizontal list. 
the title was also revised. And one of the uh, one of the phrases was revised as well. And both of these were small grammar changes that the author may or may not agree with. So the author can use the screen reader to understand the content in this list. Slide two content thing image added background image of a white wallpaper with confetti on it. Add an image to the top of the bullet item in the horizontal list. They can also sort of dig into any of these elements to understand some of the details. So here's an example. Menu, three items. Menu, three, added an image of a man reading a book while listening to its audio to the top of first list item. Added an image of a woman holding a CD, which is an old technology, to the top of second list item. Added an image of a QR. So after reading any change, the author can activate the edit mode with their screen reader to directly edit the slide content. Slide two, content, edit, button, group. Update, but edit text, backward, edit text, title, in edit text, title, title. What's amazing is you are space, I, T, S, comma. Out of edit text, edit text, update, button. All right, second, the, the describer provides layout changes, and that describes how the overall layout has changed between the two slide versions. So here's an example. Um, overall layout changes, the title is placed to the top left of the slide, three text elements and three image elements are placed below the title and all elements are overlaid on the background image. So this is much higher level information than you would have gotten with that low level pixel detail. That's not super helpful if you're using a screen reader. So Describer also shares uh, changes to groups of elements. So for instance, it has this overall group layout change, which is converting a previous vertical list into this horizontal format. Finally, Describer describes changes to the slide style. So in this example, um, the title has been changed from a plain text font to a purple, uh, impactful, larger font uh, called Pansy, I think. And then the three other bullet points were also changed in terms of the font style. So Describer is provided, uh, powered by several algorithmic methods, and I'll just cover one of them. So Describer first extracts and finds corresponding elements from each of the slides. So at the top of the slide, uh, we've extracted the text elements. This, ca uh, this catches your eye. And then it just says, add a cover photo of the book, The Boys Omnibus Volume 1. So this is an instruction that the blind presenter has provided to the sighted collaborator to add an actual image. And then on the revised slide, we extract all of the image and text elements that appear. We look at the similarity between each of the individual images and the and text and the original um, slide elements to find the best matches. And so here, for example, uh, we found this alignment from this catches your eye to got your eye with as, as the best match. And we detect that the text add cover photo is detected to the lower left photo. After that, once we find the, the aligned elements, we apply templates to create uh, the change descriptions. So how do these change descriptions actually help uh, video authors? So we recruited six blind presentation authors. Um, and then we had uh, two different presentations. Both of these presentations were collected from blind presentation authors, and we hired a professional slide creator on Upwork to create the revised slides. Then creators use two different interface conditions. So they use either accessible slides. So be, basically, uh, it just listed the slide elements along with those lower level visual details that are pretty difficult to understand. And then we compared it to Diffscriber. And we asked creators to write down the changes that occurred between the two slides, as well as to suggest revisions for the next version. What we found out is using Diffscriber, people uh, identified far more changes. Um, so in compared to 10 changes on average detected with accessible slides, people noticed about 28 changes. But more importantly, they suggested more revisions. So using accessible slides, people uh, suggested less than one revision on average, whereas when they had Diffscriber, they, uh, they on average had 2.83 changes. And the feedback was quite positive from users as well. Um, so people liked that they had more control over under being able to understand what their collaborator had done, and they felt like they would be able to take a more active role in the process. Something that was a little bit more surprising to us is that one user said that after learning about the types of uh, layouts and content that are included on slides, that they might actually uh, develop more of a personal style going forward when they suggest changes to sighted collaborators to make. All right, so to circle back to our original question, uh, how can we build accessible authoring tools that further creative agency? 
The first thing is that we can use descriptions to either improve editing or collaboration. So in AV script, we considered how to describe things like the visual quality and scenes to bring that visual information into the authoring process and directly enable editing. On the other hand, uh, slides currently involve a lot of uh, spatial layout information, uh, which is sort of difficult to do with the current editing tools. So we provided descriptions at least to enable uh, more agency during the collaboration process. So another thing we found out through working on this is that the descriptions that people want for authoring is a little bit different than the descriptions people need for consuming. For instance, if I'm just watching a video for fun, I might want to know that there's a fun montage of a beach or Gabby's riding on a bike, but I might not want low level details about how the video quality is right. I don't necessarily want to know that the video quality is uh, bad or good at that time. Um, so when we were looking into uh, that video project, we had to kind of carefully consider what would need to be described from an authoring point of view. And I think for future work for Diffscriber, we could consider a little bit more about uh, examining how the changes would actually be perceived. For instance, is that font size now too small to see from the back of the room? Um, and these are changes you might want to understand during authoring. And finally, uh, we had this takeaway of whenever there's a lot to describe, um, one thing that one trick can be to describe what is new. Um, so we could think of in the future when people might want to edit texts or, or edit images or even generate them, um, that you might want to describe differences rather than just trying to describe only the image as a whole. So in the future, I think there's a lot of work to do, be done in this space, both of improving uh, creative accessibility tools, as well as uh, improving communication as a whole. So in my future work, I hope to investigate new media types. So here I investigated presentations and videos, uh, but in the future, we could explore AR, VR, uh, tangible and robotics and making those accessible. I have done a little bit of work, uh, collaborative work, making AR accessible, and that's been really interesting because it's sort of a primarily visual medium. Um, second, we might want to improve uh, the accuracy and speed of some of these systems. So I've created these like proof of concept prototypes, but I think it would be really interesting to explore some of the new models that are coming out uh, and see how it's changed the automated systems uh, capabilities. And finally, it would be super cool to support new audiences. So here I've talked a lot about um, adapting media for people with visual impairments, but I think that when we go towards AR and tangible and robotics, we might need to adapt our creative uh, work for people with motor impairments and to create more accessible authoring tools. All right, and with that, I'll wrap up. So thank you all for, um, for attending this talk. And if you would like more information, feel free to email me or to check out my website. And I'm happy to take any questions and I, I, we might wait till afterwards, but thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the engaging talk. I'm really impressed by the quality of the slides and also the research itself. Um, so thanks so much. Um, actually, uh, we have a bunch of questions. Um, oh, great. The Google Docs. Um, Amazing. Yeah, well, let me start by um, the systems. I mean, the engineering um, effort uh, that is needed to develop all of these systems because uh, the systems look really well engineered and um, some of them uh, utilize existing services or, or tech stacks like OTA AI. Um, so uh, the audiences want to hear about uh, the decisions, consideration or strategy on um, how to you know, implement all these systems, um, how to um, kind of incorporate existing systems into this kind of novel user interactions. Um, do you have any ideas? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, I would say it starts with a lot of experimentation. So on every part of the system, you know, and every part of the complex system, we actually just start with a bunch of experiments with individual parts of the process. So um, so it's not like we we spec out the entire system ahead of time and that's what we build, but it's more we do a bunch of um, a, do a bunch of experiments, find out which things tend to work better, um, and then at the end we combine the systems that work the best into the final prototype. So I think there is a trade-off though. I think um, in this work, I 
tended to pick the systems that worked best uh, for the final system. But sometimes that results in a hodgepodge of different approaches. Um, and that makes the systems more difficult to deploy, for instance, um, if, if they have sort of uh, these delicate connections between different services. And so I think that there's sometimes a trade off between, oh, if we want to go deploy a system, maybe we should replace Part of it was something simpler. So for instance, I've used, uh, you know, Google for OCR in the past and then like, you know, fell back to a library I found on GitHub that was a little bit worse, but way easier to integrate. So it's it's a good question because that's a constantly changing, uh, <laughs> a changing thing. But I would say that's that's an overview. So experiment a lot, find what works and then try to keep it as simple as possible to keep that performance um, high still. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. So um, probably related to this point, um, it seems like you are using uh, some of the existing image to text techniques. Um, and um, and sometimes you kind of incorporate um, kind of, how to say, domain-specific knowledge into the system to uh, improve the quality of the outcome. So, um, you know, given the uh, current um, trend of AI advancement, uh, there are a bunch of these new te technologies um, born day to day, um, but um, are they practical enough by themselves, or do we still need to add some domain specific knowledge to make it like usable for the users? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question because I think I, I think it's mixed, especially so I've I've been playing a lot with the um, uh, Blip V two. Uh, it has like some so a really nice captioning tool and the question answering, uh, the visual question answering. So asking a question like, oh, is this video blurry uh, or is this video frame blurry and getting an answer like that's getting increasingly better over time. Um, so I think that like, I guess there's two types, there's two ways I use domain specific knowledge. So the first one is to kind of inform like the automated system that we create, but there's a second where it's like, there might be some limit to how well the system can perform on something that's highly expert. And so there's not a bunch of data about. So I'll just, I'll kind of give an idea of like two current projects we're working on. So um, in one project, uh, this we are working on uh, like short videos. So TikToks, for instance, and a lot of that content is humorous. Uh, it's it's light and some of it's expert content, but some of it's like kind of generic. And so for these videos, we can actually start to use these new methods to get really high quality descriptions that will maybe work right away. Like the problem is, you know, OCR and simple content description. On the other hand, we're also working on a project about live streaming. Live streaming often involves like really complex like gaming scenarios and the descriptions are we don't even know what we want out of the, those descriptions first to start with. And then the descriptions definitely aren't really good enough to uh, like describe that type of content. So I think for the most expert content, there's a ways to go. Um, and for less expert content, there's less of a ways to go. But even if it was good, we would have to know what we wanted. So I think it's important to do research on this early before the systems get good. So we know that what we want them to describe when we get closer to that point. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sounds like a pretty familiar, but um, important answer as an ACA researcher in the field. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so um, we still have some questions, but um, I will leave it in the panel. And also probably we can answer it after the seminar even. So yeah, uh, let's great. just move on to um, uh, seeing you Bruce's uh, talk. It's really my honor to introduce uh, seeing you Bruce Liu from UCLA. Um, can you uh, share the screen? Yeah. Uh, just give me a sec. Sure. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Thank okay, you. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. My name is uh, Bruce. So first of all, thank you so much, Joon and Yuki for inviting me to this talk. And uh, I'm a PhD student at UCLA. And today I'm happy to share some research projects that I've been working on in the past two years about how we can uh, empower humans with AI in a multimodal world. Um, so before we start, just to give me a, give you a brief introduction, uh, I'm doing my PhD in the UCL HCI lab and advised by Professor Anthony Chen. And before that, I did my undergrad at CMU with a double major in machine learning and HCI. And uh, actually I'm coming to Japan very soon. So I'll be visiting the University of Tokyo uh, at Professor Takeo Igarashi's lab. And I'll be staying here for nearly five months until September. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting to know more HCI people in Japan and also uh, looking for potential collaboration opportunities. So yeah, back to the talk. Um, I would like to start this talk uh, by showing this video that I recorded uh, in the Universal Studio in Los Angeles. 
and I was on their uh, famous uh, studio tour ride. So in this video, as a viewer, you can probably see that uh, there's a, this special effect of a water flood in this kind of uh, Mexican small town. Uh, however, if you really think about it, if you think about how I experienced uh, this effect at that moment, actually I was experiencing uh, several different things. So oh, first of all, uh, my eyes were seeing this uh, effect, obviously. And my ears were hearing uh, the sound of the water and also the uh, tour guide uh, who was adding their commentary and also uh, the cheerings uh, from the crowd. And my hands in general, my tactile sensory was feeling the water drops, making my hands and maybe my face uh, wet. And even my nose uh, was smelling the moisture, the humid air. So actually I was experiencing this effect through a variety of channels, a variety of modalities. And in addition to how uh, we per perceive the world, we also communicate with multiple modalities. So for example, when you're talking to someone face-to-face, uh, -face, although the maj majority of information is conveyed through language or your vocal channel, you're actually also using your hand gestures, your facial expressions, and many others to transmit information. So the point is that as humans, we process and communicate information uh, using a diverse set of sensory channels, such as visual, auditory, and tactile. So this kind of multimodal interaction allows us to understand uh, more complex content and communicate in a more effective way with others and really support us uh, throughout our daily lives. However, uh, while we live in such a multimodal world, these modalities are not always uh, equally accessible to everyone. And some individuals may face challenges when trying to engage with information or interact through certain modalities. So for example, let's go back to the first video. Uh, imagine people with visual impairments, they may not be able to see uh, what is going on. Why is everyone on the bus so excited? Uh, and people with hearing impairments, they may not be able to know the background story introduced by the tour guide or feeling, just in general, feeling the atmosphere from the crowd. And moreover, even individuals without disabilities, they can also experience temporary situational impairments that may hinder our capabilities. So for example, I was on this tour when the, uh, during the pandemic and the mask mandate was still on. And you know, if you wear glasses, it's very easy to get your glasses fogged by your breath. Uh, while wearing a mask and actually I have to take my glasses off like once in a while which is like really annoying and on the other hand uh, sometimes these modalities are not uh, fully utilized so go back to this video when we're having a conversation we're mostly focusing on the verbal content and barely using the visual channel to do anything so just to think about just to imagine like uh, having the visual channel, think about if we fully utilize it, how much we could add to our conversation in addition to just solely having a, a verbal communication channel. So given these two points, the unequal accessibility of modalities and the underutilization of certain modalities in our everyday interactions, the question is how can we um, design interfaces and technologies that truly embrace the richness of our multimodal world. So to be more specific, how can we support humans' capabilities to understand and interact with multimodal information? And how can we augment humans' capability to convey multimodal information? So I think with the recent advancements in uh, multimodal machine learning, I believe now we actually have an opportunity to, to design and build systems to address uh, these challenges and explore how the future should look like. So in 2021, uh, OpenAI released a clip, which is, uh, the, the full name is, is Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training, which is a, a neural network that is trained to understand images and text by jointly learning from a very large data set of images and their associated uh, text descriptions. 
And for the first time, uh, you can actually calculate a correspondence score uh, between text and image. And also you can do open vocabulary, uh, zero shot uh, image classification or image description. Um, and following, uh, starting from there, uh, there are various models like uh, Flamingo, which is the image a question answering model which understands the image and can interactively respond to uh, humans' questions. And of course, the recently uh, released uh, uh, GPT-4, which can also take in uh, image as, up, as an input. And in addition to like connecting text and images, there are also like generative models, such as uh, DALI-2 and Stable Diffusion, that can generate uh, high-resolution images from textual descriptions. And also, of course, uh, the recent advancements in large language models um, that's able to capture uh, knowledge uh, and also uh, common sense uh, and also do reasoning uh, with, uh, with, with uh, textual representations. So uh, why is this special? So I think um, those advances in AI have made it possible for the first time um, to allow us to unify, connect, compare, and even transform information in different modalities. Uh, you can now measure, for example, measure the similarity between an image and a piece of text. You can generate a story from an image. You can generate a short video from a text description. So leveraging all these new capabilities of multimodal AI, uh, what can we support? And what are some new things that we can achieve for human computer interaction? So in this talk, I'll present uh, some of my most recent projects that tries to explore this underlying uh, opportunities for those two questions. I'll be focusing on these three papers, uh, Cross Ally, which was published, uh, it's a co, uh, it, it's a work with Amy, uh, published in Waste 2022. And uh, Human I always, it's my most recent work, it's still under review, uh, and Visual Captions. Uh, which was is going to be published in the upcoming CHI 2023 conference. So yeah, so let's uh, start by talking about a cross ally. And so uh, in this work, we look at videos. As Amy just introduced, a uh, video is a kind of medium that uses uh, two modalities, the audio and the visual to convey information. And uh, many videos have accessibility problems that make the content uh, visually inaccessible to blind and visually impaired audiences. So to address these issues, uh, people will add audio descriptions to describe the important visuals. So uh, for example, in this clip, um, the host flips the pan over, but never described it. And in addition, uh, videos can be auditorily inaccessible to uh, deaf and hard of hearing audiences. So in this case, people would add uh, closed captions that transcribe the speech and non-speech sounds. However, identifying video accessibility issues is actually very challenging uh, and time consuming. So others have to always manually watch the video all the way through and playing and just checking if uh, the visual and audio information is inaccessible. And if not, they'll have to describe it. And um, they often have to watch the whole video uh, multiple times. And this is especially hard for uh, novice uh, describers. So um, most existing accessibility systems rely on using speech as a proxy for accessibility. Um, so they assume that uh, a video clip will be accessible if there's a synchronous line of narration and accessibility issue occur when there are gaps in speech. Um, but in this project, we find that speech is not often, a, often not a good proxy for uh, accessibility. So for example, Many video types, such as vlogs, tutorials, lectures, may not feature significant gaps in speech. 
And more importantly, um, the mere presence of speech does not mean that the clip will be accessible. So for example, in this video. Pretty quintessential millennial. I love contemporary art. I love glitch art, anything with a digital medium. So in this example here, the author was talking about her favorite arts. However, visually, she's actually showing a teddy bear on her bed. And the speech does not actually describe the visuals, so they're mismatched. And in this case, people who cannot see the visuals will miss this information completely. So to enable people to identify and address accessibility issues more efficiently, uh, we introduce CrossAlly. So CrossAlly uses a cross-modal grounding pipeline. Uh, it automatically locates uh, the visual and the audio accessibility issues. And secondly, it allows authors to address those accessibility issues uh, through an integrated interface. And thirdly, it uh, automatically creates a more accessible video from the author descriptions. So the core idea of our system is to view accessibility as a, a modality asymmetry problem. As we've shown in the previous examples, a video may contain information that is conveyed only through the visual channel or only through the audio channel. And uh, those information will be inaccessible to people who cannot see or hear the content respectively. So therefore, uh, our goal is to locate uh, all these modality asymmetries in a video. So to do that, uh, in this project, we introduced a cross-modal grounding pipeline. So first, we, um, similar to Amy's project, we split the audio and visual track and segment them into information bits. So in this case, we segment audio into sentences and non-speech segments and uh, the visuals into shots. And then we leverage a pre-trained uh, multimodal machine learning model uh, to compute the correspondence score for each audio visual pair. So specifically, we map uh, the audio and visual segments to a joint embedding space and compute their dot product. And this result will represent how semantically similar the information in two modality is. And after computing the scores for all audio visual pairs, we'll have a correspondence matrix. So ideally, if um, this recipe video is really well made and uh, completely accessible, you should expect that everything here on this diagonal line uh, should all have really high scores because you know the visuals are synchronously described by the speech step-by-step -step, and uh, the audio is also synchronously captioned. However, after computing all the uh, similarity scores and plotting the correspondence matrix, you can immediately see that um, these two columns here are matched to nothing. So these two uh, visual shots or visual clips were never described in the audio. And similarly, this row here uh, is matched to nothing, meaning that the audio was never captioned or mentioned in the video. And here's an example of a matrix of a, a YouTube video computed using our algorithm, and you can really easily uh, identify those unmatched segments. And in that way, we'll consider these segments as uh, potential accessibility issues. So uh, with this computational pipeline, we uh, developed an interface to help people improve video accessibility. So this is our interface. And the first thing you will notice that on the uh, bottom left of this interface, uh, there are two timelines, an audio track and a visual track. And each track is uh, divided into segments with different colors. And the level of uh, redness here of each segment will represent how inaccessible it is predicted to be. So it's computed by the aggregated uh, correspondence score. And users can simply uh, click on the segments to quickly navigate through the video. And especially they can click on the red segments to see the accessibility issues. And once they identify issue, they can use the captions pane here on the right um, and the video description pane here to add a caption or an audio description of the segment. 
So uh, for example, you can see uh, in this video, the first audio segment is detected as inaccessible. And after playing it, you know that it is a uh, background music that was never described in the caption. So you can conveniently add that. And here you can find that there's a visual track that was never described. So you can uh, simply describe that visual segment and save it. And you can see that uh, when you click to save uh, your edits, uh, the vertical sidebar and the corresponding timeline here on the right, uh, on the left, will turn to blue uh, to signify that an issue is addressed. And as we all know, machine learning models is not 100% accurate. So if the model has a false positive prediction, we can also dismiss uh, the predicted uh, accessibility issue pretty easily and allowing the creators to make the final decision. So basically the user's target uh, would be to eliminate all the red segments in uh, the timelines here and address all the accessibility issues. And users can also preview their captions and descriptions instantly after the edits. Remember to use more extra foil on the end to create a So to uh, validate the effectiveness of our computational pipeline, uh, we actually conducted the technical evaluation. Uh, we randomly selected 20 videos uh, covering a wide range of topics and manually labeled uh, accessibility issues in those videos according to video description guidelines uh, and use that as a ground truth for our evaluation. So we used uh, both the gaps in speech method as a baseline and also our uh, uh, cross ally method uh, to detect all the accessibility issues. So we find that uh, for visual accessibility issues, although cross ally had a slight, slightly lower precision comparing to the gaps in speech approach, you can see that the recall score is significantly higher uh, from around 38% to over 98%. And actually, if you think about it, we actually prefer high recall to high precision uh, when detecting accessibility issues, because we want to make sure that authors do not miss any uh, issues. And we want to make sure that they review everything and they can easily inspect the issues and dismiss the ones that are already accessible. And for audio accessibility issues, our systems uh, had a higher precision and F1 score on our samples. And in addition, we also conducted a user study with 11 participants. So we asked them to use uh, both the gaps in speech interface and our cross ally interface to make uh, four different videos accessible. And participants' performance uh, significantly improved and we observed around a 40% increase in both their precision and recall of identifying both uh, visual and audio accessibility issues. And one interesting uh, thing to notice here is that although the uh, te in technical evaluation, the precision for visual accessibility issues is pretty low, uh, in actual users, they were able to correct the errors and their precision is over 90%. And also we observed that uh, with cross ally, uh, participants felt significantly less uh, mental demanding. The task was less difficult and they felt uh, less stressed and annoyed. They also reported that they were significantly more confident in identifying those accessibility issues. Um, so many participants mentioned that uh, they employed a more dynamic workflow uh, where they would uh, still kind of skim through all the gray segments, uh, but, all, but just paying more attention to the red or uh, the predicted inaccessible ones. And this really helped them in a way that they don't have to be completely focused all the time. And they also mentioned that uh, deciding if the predictions are correct or not was so much easier than having to like go over everything and identify potential issues. Uh, they can, once they see the issues highlighted, they can like immediately determine uh, whether they are accessible or not. 
We also invited two expert content creators to use Cross Ally to make their own videos accessible. And um, they expressed large interest in integrating this tool in their workflows. Um, specifically said that seeing the issues, they would like to try to edit the video in a way that is more accessible and even rethink how to structure the video better. So uh, this is Cross Ally. Uh, we introduced a method to detect accessibility issues in videos by measuring uh, modality asymmetries in the audio and visual channels. And Cross Ally, uh, you can try it live uh, at this URL or scanning the QR code. Okay, so uh, in, in the cross ally project, uh, video convey information using uh, visual and audio channels. Um, so the next thing uh, I, I begin to think about is uh, in our daily activities, we actually interact with the world with many more different modalities. So uh, a natural question is, can we model uh, the usage of different modalities of ourselves uh, in everyday activities? and go beyond uh, the two channels, visual and audio uh, in, in videos. So just to give you a, a short example, if you are holding a bag of grocery and uh, can we do a model to know that your hand is currently occupied and not available for other tasks? So for the first two projects, we explored uh, how can we uh, support humans' capabilities uh, of in interacting with multimodal information. And for the last project I'll introduce today, uh, I would like to talk about, uh, in addition to supporting uh, existing interactions, how we can enhance and augment human capabilities uh, with more modalities, so beyond its original form. So um, uh, th this project, uh, we int introduced uh, visual captions, uh, augmenting verbal communication with under five visuals. This is also a research uh, project that I completed during my internship at Google. So um, recent computer media systems are increasingly facilitating verbal communication. Um, so platforms such as uh, Google Meet, Zoom, and Microsoft Teams uh, have been widely adopted and they all provided capabilities such as uh, live captioning and noise cancellation to facilitate our verbal communication. Well, verbal communication is the main medium for us to, to, to communicate. Uh, we also envision that uh, visual augmentations that leverage uh, the semantics in the spoken language could also be helpful. Um, for example, especially for people to convey uh, complex, nuanced, and unfamiliar information. So just imagine a future where everyone wears AR glasses. Uh, can, how can we further augment our communication capabilities by maybe also providing a parallel visual channel? Uh, and as the, the very old saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. So for example, if you are talking to your friend in a uh, restaurant and they may not know what is sukiyaki, so you could easily use visuals to more intuitively show uh, what is sukiyaki on the menu. And maybe when you are talking about your recent uh, family trip to Disneyland, you may want to show a photo from your personal album uh, of your family at Disneyland. So in this project, uh, we introduce uh, visual captions, a system that augments verbal communication by providing real-time visuals. Um, so visual captions automatically predicts the visual intent or what visuals people want to show at the moment of their conversations and uh, suggest appropriate visuals for users to immediately select and display. So to understand the space of augmenting verbal communication with visuals, we first conducted a formative study and derived a design space. Um, so participants actually envisioned uh, visual augmentations to be uh, synchronous or asynchronous with the conversation for both expressing and understanding the speech content. And more interestingly, they, they, they see that uh, they could incorporate visuals with a wide, wide range of different visual content, uh, visual types and visual sources. And uh, they also identified that they would like to interact with the AI system uh, with different levels of proactivity. So for example, uh, how much they would like the AI to take initiative, 
during the conversation versus how much they would like to take the control. So informed by our formative study, we created a, a VC 1.5K data set, uh, a data set uh, of over 1,500 quadruples of language, uh, visual content type and source uh, collected from uh, over 200 crowd workers from Amazon Turk. And our data set covers a wide range of topics, including daily conversations, uh, history videos, tour guides, documentaries, et cetera. And the crowd workers have proposed a variety of visuals, including photos, emojis, videos, 3D models, and also from different sources like internet search, social media, uh, personal albums. So using this data set, we actually fine-tuned a uh, language model GPT-3 to automatically suggest uh, appropriate visuals for a given sentence in conversations. Uh, specifically, we formatted uh, the prompt as the previous two sentences in the conversation and the completion result to be uh, the most popular uh, visual suggestions collected from the crowd workers uh, in format of uh, visual type of visual content from visual source. And uh, our fine-tuning our fine-tuning model uh, reached a validation token accuracy of eighty six percent, and we also conducted a human evaluation. Uh, so crowd workers, we sent uh, those automatically generated visuals to crowd workers and asked them to rate regarding whether they would like to show the visuals, how informative is the visuals, and the quality of relevance, uh, the appropriateness of the source and the type, etc. And uh, most of the crowd workers uh, will agree that uh, our model generates uh, proper visuals that they would like to show. So uh, let me uh, demonstrate a few examples of uh, visual captions capabilities. Um, so first of all, our model, because we use a, a large language model, it works with open vocabulary. Uh, it can show a diagram of Newton's law of universal gravitation to retrieve a photo from someone you're talking about from a personal album. And also it's able to suggest uh, multiple visuals in a given sentence. And in addition, based on the context, uh, it also is able to recommend different visual content. So for example, it knows that the difference when you're talking about the movie matrix or you're talking about the mathematical concept of a matrix. And also it's able to recognize uh, different visual types. So if you're saying, welcome to Los Angeles, it will suggest a photo of Los Angeles from, uh, from internet. But if you talk about something like, uh, where do you want to visit in Los Angeles? It will actually show a map of Los, Los Angeles. And also it's able to generate proper sources. So uh, retrieve a picture from Yosemite uh, from the internet. Versus if you say something like, we spend our, our week in Yosemite, it will retrieve a picture uh, from your personal album. So we implemented visual captions as a user customizable uh, Chrome extension uh, for video conferencing softwares. So, oh, sorry. To use it, uh, you can just uh, simply speak as you normally do. Oh. It's a routine example. So they use uh, the visuals will pop on the right. And you can uh, click it from this private scrolling view to display it to uh, the other side. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, we support different levels of AI productivity since we're running out of time. So I'll skip this part. So uh, we evaluated visual captions with 26 participants in total, where they had one-on-one uh, -on -one video conferences. And um, they found it to be really helpful uh, for them to explain and understand unfamiliar concepts, uh, making information more intuitive, clarifying language ambiguities, and also make uh, the conversations more fun and engaging. In particular, they find that uh, it's especially helpful for them to um, talk about something one party is not familiar with. They can easily explain uh, what they're talking about. And also it makes the conversation longer and more interactive between participants. And also we surprisingly found that people has a 
a wide uh, a diverse preference uh, for how they would like to interact with the AI. Um, so some would like to have the AI to be completely taking the control. Some would like to uh, have the AI to be completely controlled by them by themselves. Um, so uh, you can refer to the paper for more detailed discussion on this point. So uh, this is visual captions, uh, which augments interpersonal communication by augmenting the verbal channel of us with visuals. And visual captions is recently open sourced uh, uh, and you can access it uh, at this URL. So yeah, in today's talk, I introduced uh, three projects um, that I worked on relating to uh, processing multimodal information and also augmenting uh, multimodal communication. So cross ally, uh, human IO and visual captions. And uh, finally, I want to thank uh, my wonderful collaborators for their support uh, throughout uh, the projects and they will not be possible without uh, their huge helps. And um, yeah, that's the end of my presentation and thank you so much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Um... Great talk, and um, I'm I'm glad to see these uh, latest outcome of your work. It's really exciting. Uh, so again, uh, we have many questions, um, mm -hmm. but let me start by how um, what what brought you to this um, this line of research um, from accessibility to augmenting uh, human capabilities. Uh, what was the core motivation for you? Um, I feel like uh, actually they are, it's quite natural because on the essence, they are all about, um, so for, for, uh, cross allies about when we lack some kind of capabilities in one modalities of information. Right. And so that's leads me to naturally thinking about, oh, for conversations, we're only using the verbal channel to communicate. And in the future, why couldn't we make it more informative? Uh, if we can add a parallel channel to that. And I, I think they actually had a lot in common, a lot more uh, common grounds than than I thought. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it sounds like um, it's really about augmenting the human's capabilities. And mm -hmm. it reminds me of uh, intelligence amplifier as opposed to, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, AI versus IA. Uh, yet uh, your work looks more promising and more practical as the system is aware of the availability of the IO channels with its um, embodied uh, interaction design, uh, rather than simply saying about the intelligence. It's more like um, you're thinking of the um, IO channels uh, of human uh, beings. And given these obvious benefits, I'm also a bit concerned with the uh, information overload. Um, like, you know, if we <laughs> augment these IOs, it might be sometimes uh, too much uh, for human beings. Uh, how do you handle these mm. uh, system? Yeah, so I think, uh, so for human IO, uh, so this interface, uh, maybe it's too small to see, but uh, this visualization interface is not, it never showed to the users. It's actually only for like debugging and developing. Mm -hmm. uh, so all the users know is that uh, the system sometimes detect that, oh, my their hand is occupied or they cannot speak at the moment and the system will provide uh, corresponding adaptations. And also, I, I think that's a very important line of future work, which is like, how can we properly adapt uh, to provide adaptations to them, knowing their availability of different channels. And for, for this stage, we only focus on detection, but like the adaptation is like even, I think that's an even more complex problem. And um, we should definitely investigate into that. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Uh, so um, from the pure, oh, I, I don't know, um, the HCI uh, researchers perspective, um, mm -hmm. the audience is uh, actually amazed by uh, the technical uh, contributions in your work. Uh, like um, in, in the cross array, um, it detects the mismatch uh, using these uh, kind of computation. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm saying it in a correct way, technical correct way, but um, the question is, um, is this work um, only uh, possible because you have the dual uh, measures in machine learning and HCI or 
uh, how, how does the technical, technical part uh, possible made possible? Yeah, I think um, for cross ally, I don't. I actually feel like uh, its backbone is not. So in, in uh, we call it multimodal machine learning models uh, for mm -hmm. computer score. I, I don't think that is the most essential part. I think the the most essential part for this project uh, is the idea or the perspective to look at video accessibility problems as the modality asymmetry problems. And there are multiple different ways you can compute uh, modality asymmetry. But we just leveraged the most recent uh, machine learning model to do that. It's accurate, it's more robust. But imagine if a researcher from 10 years ago, they can also might maybe use object detection to just simply match like how many objects were mentioned in the text. Um, that could also work, right? Maybe with the lower accuracy. Um, yeah, so that's my take. I don't think uh, how I exactly implemented it is the most uh, important part in these projects. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Um, how did you come up with the ideas that you did at uh, Google internship? <laughs> is there any product-driven discussions? Yeah, so I, I think my case was a bit uh, special because uh, my mentor, usually in industry, I feel like you have to do something related to products. But my mentor actually gave uh, gave me the <laughs> freedom to do whatever I want. Uh, so actually, these two projects were, I started thinking about them uh, like before the internship, and I just proposed it to uh, my mentor, and we're just working on it together. Yeah, sounds like sounds like you had a great experience there. Yeah, glad yeah, to yeah, yeah. That. I had a lot of freedom. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think it's time to trans uh, gradually transition to the panel discussion part. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, from now on, it's um, it's totally <laughs> up to us what to discuss. But um, I think um. We had a shared question about uh, the difficulty of the evaluation studies. I mean, both of you have worked on building the uh, you know working systems and then test it with the actual users. Um, and um, the audiences uh, considered that uh, the evaluations, uh, well, the design of the evaluations uh, differ from one to uh, in, from one study to another study. But it seems like um, they are really well balanced. Uh, like you know, it, it contains performance evaluation when necessary, but it always co contains exploratory qualitative study with the real users. Um, how uh, both of you design these uh, user studies? Um, probably uh, Amy can start. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, th thanks, Bruce, for the great talk. That was awesome. Um, so I. I think that oftentimes, I guess it comes partially from what I like to know when I read about new systems. So oftentimes when I'm reading about these like complex systems, it's really helpful to know for the technical evaluation, like how well this like tool will actually perform on the the new task that you're focusing on, right? So, so we were using like some model that was existing, but for a task it hasn't been done with like, um, it hasn't been used with before. So uh, it was kind of, so every stage I like to evaluate the system from a technical approach to just give people a clue after they read it, like, okay, and here's how often that works in practice or or how it fails uh, when it doesn't work right now. Um, so, and then I, I think that like the, I find the user evaluation like most interesting from a personal perspective. Like usually we find things that are unexpected, especially when the task is more open-ended. So those are my favorite types of evaluations to do is when, you know, with AD script, we invited people to come with their own videos and try it out. And of course that requires a system that works pretty well, that, that it'll be like a, a little bit robust to different um, videos that people bring in. But, um, but I always find those super interesting. Thank you. Uh, how about you, uh, Bruce? Yeah, I think I actually think that uh, papers do not need a user study or a qualitative study if it doesn't really need it. I feel like all my uh, user studies exist for a reason. So, for example, in the mm -hmm. I always have a very clear research question, like in the beginning paragraph of each uh, user study session. Uh, so, for example, in the cross ally paper, I did the user study because I want to know, like, okay, I have this accurate system. Uh, 
how does it enable authors to efficiently identify and address those accessibility issues? Like, can they incorporate those predictions into their workflow? Uh, and in the uh, expert uh, evaluation with actual YouTubers, we want to know like how will this kind of like yeah fit the, into their video creation workflows and how to make their own videos accessible. So I feel like each section has a very clear uh, mm. question to be answered. Um, and th I think that's the, the most important thing, uh, why I included those sessions. Yeah, sections. Thank you. Yeah, it's really my pleasure to hear that both of you are enjoying the evaluations in a sense that, you know, it, you want to know something and they can only be evaluated or um, validated by the actual user study. And to do that, we need this working systems with a kind of, you know, good quality of engineering. Um, and yeah, I mean, sometimes um, I feel like uh, some people don't like evaluations because it's really difficult to design. But here uh, we're kind of in an agreement that um, it's there by reasons. And it mm -hmm. is, it's more like the academic reasons to to know something new and, and provide those insights into the readers of the papers. So it's really excellent. Thank you. Exactly. Um, yeah. Also, um, both of you are working on um, the accessibility research, um, and uh, the audiences are interested in um, the difficulty of these research in a sense that um, the researchers, I mean, the designers of the systems need to understand uh, uh, more uh, deeply about the target users. Um, and um, it's common to do uh, interviews with these uh, target users, but are there any other ways to get to know about these domains? Uh, Amy, probably? Sure. Yeah, so I think before I do any interviews with target users or reach out to them, I like to find out what already, like what, what already exists that we can learn from. Like have people written blogs? Uh, have they published videos showing how they do things? Like, so I like to, before we do, before we go out and contact, users, I like to like read all of the guidelines that have been created and all of the um, uh, like anything else that we can find. And so for some projects, that's enough, like uh, just like being able to articulate the guidelines really clearly, like a bunch of prior blind users have actually given feedback on audio description guidelines, for instance, like we don't need to interview blind users again <laughs> to find out the same thing that people have already found out. However, in some projects, like I really have needed to interview users or do something like a co-design workshop or something like this, um, because the in information we have so far isn't enough to, to build a system based off of. So I would say, for instance, for like um, for both Describer and AV Script, those were really novel um, tasks. Like, can we help blind people like author slides or videos? And so understanding their current practice and getting understanding their workflow was really helpful in informing exactly like what we designed. So Describer, we definitely didn't start by thinking we would design a tool for collaboration, but that was like, that was the key, like, um, you know, pain point right then. So, uh, so yeah. And, and I have done other types of procedures too before, like uh, co-design workshops uh, where we brought in a bunch of people with different expertise and people with disabilities to like design something together. And so I really like that approach as well. Um, if, especially if projects are more early stage and not as much of work has been done in the area so far, but I would also love to hear, uh, yeah, what you think as well. So how about you, Bruce? Yeah. Um, so I, I feel like another, another point I would like to add is that you could uh, follow or join uh, the disability community. So for example, mm -hmm. like on Twitter and on Reddit, there's a huge like disability community that you could uh, see what they are, uh, maybe their concerns about recent technology or their experiences with some, um, like for example, video editing, stuff like that. And also, yeah, there are lots of uh more much more than you think uh you, you blind youtubers on youtube <laughs> so you could definitely watch their videos and yeah uh also i think uh, another point which aligns to amy's point is uh always include them uh throughout your uh system design throughout your project not only at the end but from the very beginning and also shorter feedback loops so Mm -hmm. um, involve them at every stage of your project. That is also quite important. And yeah, yeah, 
Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to say, I love that you mentioned that because one thing um, we've done before that doesn't make it into papers is actually like have, you know, some user who really liked the idea during the form of study, have them like try out the um, try out the tool actually while designing it um, and then test it at the end. So that might not even make it into the paper, but it's sometimes like a process we use. So I just like that you bring that up. Yeah, go ahead and finish what you're saying. Oh, that that's uh, mostly it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, that's related to uh, one comment uh, left in the Google Docs, which is about the long-term evaluations. Like, you know, um, if we only want to write papers, uh, we can just kind of set a timely topic and then solve it in a technical way. But it's really great that um, you kind of involving uh, the target users as part of the research, um, as, as you said, not in the end, but from the beginning. Um, but at the same time, I feel like... Um, there was a difficulty of just academia in a sense that we need to publish papers constantly to catch up with the uh, community. Um, and so how do you think about this long-term thing, which is definitely important uh, versus these um, kind of, you know, day-to-day -day progress in this, especially in the AI community. Um, how do you feel about that? Uh, probably Bruce? Uh? Okay. Um... Yeah, I think it's actually it's, it's especially hard for accessibility research because usually there's not a huge profit in it and uh, companies wouldn't like really push for it. Um, so one thing I've been uh, thinking about recently a lot, also with Anthony, uh, is to start turning our research project into uh, to deploy it and into uh, into usable tools. So. Uh, for I haven't I haven't discussed this with with Amy yet. I was about to, but I was actually planning on <laughs> releasing uh Valley, which is like a Kai twenty twenty one uh, into a Chrome extension. Uh, that is so in that product we actually use a lot of like uh dependencies and computation heavy stuff, but we plan to like make it lighter and make it like even with lower accuracy, we want to release it to the to the market. Uh, and I think that open source effort is very important. Uh, and for me as a system researcher, I actually always would like to, when I was like working on a project, I would like to, from the beginning, I want to make something usable. I don't want to make like rid of all <laughs> stuff. I would like to, yeah, almost all my papers have a working system. So, and it, it just make it natural to turn that into a deployable uh, product. And I think it's, it's important to, keep that in mind in the beginning, because if you start with prototypes, then you might end up with prototypes and you might not ever like implement it. So yeah, that's my takes, yeah. Thank you, and, how about it, Amy? Oh yeah, I'm so happy you brought that up because I was like, oh, this is actually a perfect question to ask Bruce. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, actually the that Valley system, so it was a little bit simpler, I think, than some of the other systems that I at least I've built before and it looks like that you've built in some ways um, in that it was in, and you actually have deployed it for a little bit, like for a little bit longer. So you did this follow-up um, evaluation that lasted a couple of months where people were actually using it. So I think that project makes a lot of sense to deploy. Um, I think, so I have also deployed, I, I've, I worked on one project that was a collaboration with Cole Gleason, who's at, um, who's at Apple now, uh, that was about Twitter. And one of the evaluations we did was actually, it was a, a Chrome extension that made images more accessible. And that project was even simpler than Valley. And so we were able to deploy that for about like two weeks for a user study. Um, so I think it's like finding the right projects where it, is like close to being deployed and like taking that opportunity when it exists. Um, some of the ongoing work I'm working on now with some of these new um, vision and language models, after users used it in the user study, they really enjoyed it. And so, and it, it is simple enough that we can deploy. So I'm kind of excited to try that out. Uh, but I have quickly found out that cost is also another, <laughs> another concern as soon as you start using, um, you know, these really expensive GPUs and stuff like that. So um, yeah. that's a new concern. Like I think before I was really thinking of like simplicity of systems, but as you use like more and more comp computation, like the actual cost might, might be substantial as well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Just, just another point I <laughs> just thought yeah. about. Yeah, so uh, another point is if you work with industry, uh, if, for example, if you're doing industry internship, it, it's like more likely to get your product uh, shipped. So for yeah. example, my my Snap internship project was shipped at the uh, it's a Snapchat lens. Uh, and my Google project was open sourced uh, like very shortly after I finished it. So, and they because they have like 
engineers to specifically work on that, right? So yeah, just a small point. Oh yeah, but I think it's an important point. I mean, the relationship between ourselves in the academia and people in the industry is, I mean, is, is double-sided um, in a sense that, you know, on the one side, um, it becomes easier to get deployed um, if it's you know, prof profitable or uh, actually uh, beneficial for the actual target users. But on the other side, um, it might be difficult because it, it just um, makes them difficult to invest um, in the case of, for example, accessibility um, related research. Um, and us as uh, scholars, um, I think we we might be able to put a bit more effort on these um, area, which might not be covered by the industry by themselves. Uh, so I, I think it's really like the complementing with each other. Um, and it's really great to hear all these perspectives from both of you. Um, so uh, related to the point of the accessibility, um, there are, you know, this growing um, demand on the guidelines for human AI collaborations, uh, both in the industry and even in society level. Um, do you think that uh, these guidelines for human AI collaborations are also applicable for visually impaired people? Or do we need kind of special considerations on these context of collaborations? Um, uh, Amy, probably? Yeah, sure, I can start. Um, so I think that the challenge of guidelines is that they they are intentionally vague and may like created to apply in a bunch of different scenarios. Um, as a practitioner, what can be difficult is trying to apply that guideline to your specific scenario. Um, and while I actually think that many high level guidelines I've seen before can be useful in the accessibility context, uh, like what it means to, you know, give feedback about system status, for instance, like that's just going to change depending on the uh, modalities that are available to you um, and the amount of, you know, information, like where you're going to place that information. So I think that there's a lot of interesting design considerations that lie between a really high level guideline and a low level uh, thing that you're doing. And I, I guess one approach I've actually taken in my research in the past is like actually identify and actually with, with Bruce as well is identifying uh, guidelines that we would like people to apply <laughs> and then creating systems that help them apply the guidelines, right? And so this isn't about the human AI collaboration guidelines, but, um, you know, in Bruce's project or in Rescribe, um, we looked at audio guide, audio description guidelines and helped people apply those in practice because even when they're specific, it's difficult to, it's difficult to do. So yeah, I think the human AI collaboration guidelines, I, I think that they're so helpful and especially in teaching people how to build new systems uh, by using examples from the past and motivating those guidelines. But I do think that there's like so much interesting research that takes place between the high level guideline and the actual implementation. Thank you. Um... Do you have anything that, uh, Bruce? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll add a few points of how, uh, like, the people with disabilities actually like it, how they interact with AI differently. Uh, there's actually a lot of research on that. So, for example, the most famous one is probably WizWiz. Like, basically, uh, people previous people used like uh, be before like the uh, the visual language models. Uh, people use uh, some image uh, captioning models to automatically generate alt text for blind users. But uh, they ignore the fact that actually when blind users take a picture, uh, it's always like either blurry or like at a tilted angle. Uh, angle and it makes the model like act, uh, perform really poorly on those data sets. So yeah, it always exists. And another point I, I was thinking about is like for lots of uh, people with disabilities, they don't have, they, 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 there's a lack of a way for them to uh, confirm the results or even look at the results AI generated. Um, there's no way for them to know it, like if they are correct or not. So yeah, I think it, it, it's, it should be, uh, there should be some fundamental differences, uh, but yeah, I haven't looked into, look into myself personally, but yeah, yeah just a few uh, examples that I thought of. I, I really like that you brought up those examples because I have mm -hmm. I have noticed that like that's something that 
we've been thinking a lot about as well. So I talked about Diffscriber, which was this tool for enabling like human to human collaboration uh, by making it easier. The ultimate goal of that was to actually, you know, uh, you know, Microsoft PowerPoint actually creates a bunch of varieties of slides that you can choose between. Like there are automated design tools that actually work pretty well, uh, but communicating the results of those tools is a little bit harder. So I think that there's probably, there's maybe something to be learned there too among like, okay, how do humans and humans do this task and can we you know uh make some of those generative tools more useful with to people with disabilities by uh figuring out how like maybe a human would describe um the results to people yeah. so yeah mm -hmm. and i i think one more thing i would add is that like off i i guess in our research we're sometimes focusing on tasks that people that are, there aren't data sets for already and so mm -hmm. um so it can take some to design like there's no clear data set for describing mm -hmm. slides to people with visual impairments right so it can take some design work to figure out um what you want kind of um, to be described at all yeah thank you yeah sounds like um perfect uh conclusion of this um panel discussion which is about something about the creativity uh, both in the sense that uh, the creativity in the uh, user side and also the creativity demanded on the researcher's side when we don't have the data sets. Uh, we need to dig into the actual problem and then look into what we really need as a system design. So thank you so much. Um, now uh, we're uh, kind of running out of time, uh, but it's really great to have uh, both of you um, in this um, second edition of the seminar. Um, before uh, ending, I, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce uh, something, one of advertisement, which is related to creativity. And actually it's really related to what we discussed today, uh, which is really about the research in the wild, uh, because um, we're holding this special interest group on creativity and cultures in computing at a CHI 2023 this month. Uh, with uh, two of the invited speakers at the first edition of, of this seminar series. Um, and what we think here is um, creativity support tools uh, has a long history of uh, research in the context of HCI, but they are typically evolved in the controlled laboratory setting and do not necessarily capture creativity in the wild. Uh, but you know, today we agreed that we it's really important to think about uh, what people are doing in the wild and uh, capture these actual use cases uh, in the research settings and then kind of uh, providing these uh, research outcome to, to themselves, uh, not as a research papers per se, but uh, beyond that. Um, and this um, special business group meeting uh, will be held at CHI. So if there are people interested in this topic, uh, just jump in. Uh, it's, it will be a kind of hybrid uh, a hybrid uh, meeting. So uh, you can join via Zoom or you can drop by this room. And uh, a bit of an advertisement at the next edition. The next edition will not be a typical seminar, but rather a casual community, community meeting discussing what we find at CHI 2023, uh, definitely including uh, the talks by uh, Bruce and Amy uh, at CHI uh, that we saw today. But um, I'm really looking forward to uh, listening to these talks at Kai. So see you again in May. Um, and thank you again for uh, coming to this talk, um, uh, Bruce and Amy. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, yep, thank you so much for hosting. Thank you so much for hosting. This is really cool. <laughs> yeah, bye. thank you so much. Uh, so, okay, now, yeah, bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>